Welcome, my friend, Rory. It's so good to see you. We like talk every week now. I mean, you've just changed <laughs> our lives. You've been such an impact on our lives business-wise. You're a oh. master, master strategist. You're a Darth Vader of the business world, but actually you're Rory, Va- <laughs> Rory Vaden, but you know, we're now going to call you Darth Vader just because you Darth said- Darth Vaden. You can call me Darth Vaden. My friends you, gave me Va- Darth Vader. Vader. Uh, Vader, Vader Aid, no, no, year. I'm calling you Darth Vader Aid, no, you Darth Vader of the business world there. Jory, you've been such a lot to our family and to our business in terms of just guiding us to think about what it is that we, what is it, what, what are we the answer to? What is the question mm. that we the answer to? And you're, you're so good at guiding people to do that. So I am absolutely thrilled to have you on my podcast. You're amazing. You're a good friend. You're just your good friend of Lewis Howes, who's another good friend of ours. You're the co-founder with your beautiful wife of the Builders. The Let me get to say this name correct here. The Brand Builders Group. And you help people transform not only their lives to impact others, but their businesses. And I say lives first because I really think you change people mm. and then you change businesses and then you change lives. So that's a real gift. And thank you for being with us today. Then welcome to Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Yeah, thank you for having me. It, it, it's an honor. I think so Brand Builders Group's a personal brand strategy firm, right? And we work with, you know, experts and authors, speakers, coaches, entrepreneurs. But the way we describe them is mission-driven messengers. And, you know, when I think about the intersection there between what we do and mental health, it's this idea of just finding your identity, finding your purpose, finding meaning for your life has so much to do with just feeling great and just having a place in the world and, and its identity. So I, I, I've been thinking a lot about it ever since you and I became friends of just what, what's the intersection there. And it's just, I'm such a fan of your work. Obviously we shared the stage at Lewis's event and I just love what you're about. So thanks for having me. This is going to be great. It's going to be great. And thank you for, thank you for agreeing to come on. So one of the things that really grabbed me about, well, there's so many statements that you make and you drop these bombs, these pills of wisdom. I mean, you work with our team because you you work with teams, you work with companies and you help with brand, as you said, brand development, you help with strategy. And we have so many things going on in our business and you've helped us to start the process. It's obviously an ongoing process and we're working with you over time, but, and you have many different incredible ways that we can work, that you work with people, but you started helping us to look at everything in our, in, in what we do and to focus on what is the most important and to really build that because you, you you make comments like if you do to what did you you dilute your offering i'd love to start there because that's a great place and then i'll then i've highlighted a few statements that you've made that have really impacted myself and my team that i'd also love to dive in that are not only good for business but they are mentally so healthy in terms of shifting mm. how you think about yourself so let's talk about that diluting principle a little bit i know it kind of sounds back to front but that was very impactful for us as a team no, I I love that. Thank you. And and it's it's interesting because this concept actually came from my first book. So my first book was called Take the Stairs. And it's all about the psychology of overcoming procrastination and increasing self-discipline. And that book hit the New York Times. That was when I broke through the wall and I was 29 years old. And you know, that that was a that was a whole journey. But now that we help personal brands to become basically more well-known and and to, to grow their revenue and turn their reputation into revenue, a lot of times people, it's, it's really understanding why do people fail and why do they struggle? And the reason that personal brands fail or entrepreneurs fail or anybody with a practice or a mission or a message fails to reach more people is the same reason why people, one of the same reasons why people fail with procrastination. And it's because when you have diluted focus, you get diluted results. It's as simple as that. If you have diluted focus, you get diluted results. And we live in a distracted world. I mean, and and distraction is this dangerously deceptive saboteur of our goals because we think, oh, maybe I'm not smart enough or I don't have the right connections or whatever. But in reality, it's just that we are spread so thin and we mm-hmm. allow ourselves, or we allow our attention to be spread so thin, our time, our money, our resources, and inside of a, even a person's business, mm-hmm. they're speaking to too many different audiences. They have too many different revenue streams. They're trying to be on too many different social media platforms. And 
when you 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 can't do that effectively, right? It's it's the it's the whole Chinese proverb: "He who chases two rabbits catches neither." And that's yeah. I think that's what people are are struggling with in their personal lives and also in terms of their professional strategy and and their you know as business owners, it's the same same issue. And it's difficult, though, Rory, because if you so if you if you so into your your message and you understand so deeply the impact on so many different areas, it's very difficult to know what to not focus on if it all seems so interlinked. And it does. You 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 didn't, for example, tell us to stop everything. You just told us to kind of group it more, you know, and to see what was the main focuses. And so the dilution is looks a little different. There's a little different level of dilution for each focus, each company, each strategy, each brand or whatever it is. And that that's interesting. But that I love the fact that you say, you know, if you focus on too many things, trying to catch two rabbits, you catch nothing. That is, it's it's a hard thing to actually, what do you say no to? And And you're a master at guiding people as well into asking the questions of yourself to know what to say no to. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, well, I mean, Part of what I think it's important for people to understand is I think a lot of times people think that if they make the wrong choice, things won't work out. And so they try to make the perfect choice, right? Or they'll go like, what's the thing I should say yes to? Or what's the thing that I should say no to? Mm -hmm. And I actually think it has less to do with that. And it has more to do with the simple, the simple fact, just on a surface level, that if you have a limited number of resources, if you put those limited resources into making fewer things successful, the likelihood of those fewer things being successful increases exponentially versus spreading okay. limited resources across a number of things. And so it's not so much about figuring out what's the right decision to make as it is about making a decision and then making it right, choosing to say, I'm going to go all in on this thing. I'm going to focus on this thing in, in the Take the Stairs book where we talk about time, you know, where we, we it was the same concept when we were helping people multiply their time. Of course, my TED, my TED talk that went viral. Oh, I want to talk this. about that. Yeah, it's amazing. Talk about, mm-hmm. talk about that, how to multiply time. But we, we use this idea. Here's how it applies with time. In time, in management, there's this horrible notion of balance. There's this word balance that people use all the time when they talk about time, they think about time. And I think the word balance is a horrible metaphor for how to spend our time just because of what the 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 like the scientific definition of balance means equal force in opposite directions. Mm-hmm. And so to truly be balanced, that implies that we should spend equal amount of time in different areas. But if you sleep eight hours a day and you work eight hours a day, then the only way you could be balanced is to do one other activity and you'd have to do that other activity eight hours every day, which is <laughs> completely impractical impractical, yeah. and also totally unnecessary. You don't have to work out eight hours a day to be in great shape. You don't you don't have to read eight hours a day to to be one of the smartest people on the planet. You don't have to spend eight hours a day talking to your spouse to have one of the richest, most meaningful relationships. You know, that's that's possible. You don't have to spend eight hours a day managing your money to be financially free. And so this idea of balance, it's like we're spreading ourselves thin. In reality, the people who really win in the world are the people who focus. They know that precision is power. They deliberately, and so we we use this the alternate metaphor that we offer. And I'm getting, I'm no, I'm taking it back to the old school with with the take the stairs book, is what we call the harvest principle. And if you look at farmers, right, like when the harvest season comes, they go all in, like they're working 16, 18 hours a day because the harvest is when the harvest is, and life happens more in seasons than it does in perfect equilibrium balance. It's like, I have, so I have two kids, right? I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And like, I had to stop my my speaking. You know, I used to speak all the time and it was like, I had to slow that down. We had to change things for a season because, you know, I've got these two little monkeys running around just making life crazy around here. And it's a, it's a season, you know, when you have a startup, that's a season. If you're going mm-hmm. through a divorce, that's a season. If you're in college, that's a season. 
So if you're having some struggle in your life, it's not going to be forever. It's a season. And we might have to go, we might have to give ourselves permission to embrace the season that we're in and be okay spending our time and energy and resources on whatever is the most important thing for that season and put everything else kind of on autopilot. And I think that's actually the key to, to breaking through. I really like that. It's, it's, that's so true because everything's always changing. So I think we people are that balance thing and we get so fixated that I've got to do this and then that's what it is for the rest of time or the rest of whatever. And it's not because it's that season that works now, but you have to shift it again because we've yeah. caught ourselves saying things and it's this, these words from you that also helped us to kind of be released from, Hey, why did we do it like that? And then Rory's voice came in my head saying exactly what you've just said in, in slightly different words. Hey, it's this time now. That was for then. That worked. We wouldn't have got to where we are now if we didn't do that then. And yes, there's things we've learned, all those things that we know. And, but we were able to shift our perspective because a lot of the stuff we know instinctively, but when we put it, when it comes, when the push comes to shove, we can forget a lot of those principles and don't always apply them in our life. So to take that principle mm -hmm. you've just said and to look at, okay, I'm in this season. What is the right thing for this season? Where do we take those resources? What's the right thing that worked for then? It doesn't work for now. Yeah. And those are the questions we've been asking ourselves as well. And it's, it's powerful. It's painful, but it's powerful. And it's painful because it means you're going to have to say no. And that's another thing you teach so mm -hmm. well is how much time we waste saying no or yes to the wrong things and no to the wrong things and yes to the right, whatever, whichever way around it is. So maybe that's a great transition point to chat about that a little bit. The yes, sure. no. Yeah, well, so in, in, my, in Take the Stairs, we talk about three different types of procrastination. Classic procrastination, which is consciously delaying what you know you should be doing. Then we invented a term called creative avoidance which is unconsciously developing, you know, doing things as a way of avoiding the things you should be doing. And then there's a third type of procrastination that we call priority dilution. And that is interruption. That's the chronic overachievers procrastination where they're not lazy, but they they get interrupted. And so we, we, a lot of chatter developed around priority dilution. And so then we wrote our second book around how to multiply time because everyone was like, I'm so busy. I'm so overwhelmed. And the the TED Talks called How to Multiply Time. The book is not. The book is called Procrastinating on Purpose. We should have called it How to Multiply Time. But anyways, the way that you multiply time is very simple. And, and everyone thinks, Dr. Leaf, right? They think, oh, time is the one thing you can never get more of. And we're programmed our entire life that time is the one thing you can never get more of. And it's really not true. Mm-hmm. You can multiply your time and I can teach you in one sentence how to do it. So the way you multiply time is by making decisions today or spending time on things today that create more time tomorrow. You spend time on things today that create more time tomorrow. You make so decisions today that create more time tomorrow. And so that whole methodology in the TED Talk in the book is about the five permissions to multiply your time. The first one is what you're talking about, is eliminate. Why does this work? It works because anything that I say no to today saves me time tomorrow. And that is a part of what the mindset shift that must happen is you have to make what we, this is what we call the significance calculation. So it is true that there's nothing we can do inside of one day to create more time. All of us have the same 24 hours, which is 1,440 minutes or 86,400 seconds. <laughs> so we can't do anything to create more time today, but that's exactly the problem. We have to break free of the paradigm of thinking about one day, and we have, we have to instead think about tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and, and, and we call that the significance calculation. Inside of the frame of right here, right now, if someone asks me to do something or I have an idea or I have a million ideas, I struggle to say no because I either don't want to let them down or I don't want to be a jerk or I go, well, this seems like such a great idea. How could we not, how could we not do this? Mm -hmm. But that's the, that is what happens when you're living without a significance perspective. When you, when you, 
make the significance calculation, you think about tomorrow and the next day and the next day, what you realize is you go, hmm, if I say yes to this, and this is part of the insight on this particular strategy is you have to realize that anytime you say yes to one thing, you're simultaneously saying no to an infinite number of others. So we try to go through life never saying no because because we're good, you know, you're a nice person because you don't want to be a jerk. But what I realized in my own life was that it's futile to try to go through life never saying no because you're always saying no to something. Mm. If I say yes to the thing today, like if I say yes to every coffee meeting that I get invited on, then I inadvertently am saying no to more time on my business or with my family or to my health. And so what you realize is you go, "Mm, if I'm not consciously saying no to the things that don't matter, I end up unconsciously saying no to the things that do matter. Mm. Either way, I'm saying no, and and, and it's, it's a conundrum because by trying to be a nice person to everybody, I end up often ignoring the things that matter most to me in my life, and I've said no to those things, and it happens accidentally. It happens inadvertently, subconsciously, and the same thing happens with the business strategy, right? So when we're, when we're coaching business owners to go, okay, how are we going to make millions of dollars. Lewis is, this is actually the story of Lewis Howes. I don't know if you, I, I, I've yeah. shared this with you. Yeah. Right. When we first started working with Lewis Howes and he's been so generous, overly generous about praise for us, right? He would have been way successful. He already was successful before we found him, but it is true that, that, you know, it took him like eight years to grow the podcast to 30 million downloads. And then in like two and a half years, when we worked together, he went from 30 million to 500 million downloads. It's crazy. And he went from a, a few million dollars a year in revenue to eight figures. And it wasn't so much of some secret technique that we talk, taught him. It was a strategy that when he first started working with us, he had 17 revenue streams. And we said, what if we shut all of those down and only did what would happen if you went all in on the podcast? If you just did all in on that one thing, and to his credit, that's what he did. And the podcast exploded. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because of a gimmick. It wasn't because of a tactic. It was a strategy to go, let's focus on fewer things. So, you know, in the business world, even Mm -hmm. even in our personal lives, right? People say, you should have multiple streams of income. It's like, oh, you gotta have multiple streams of income. Well, I'm not against multiple streams of income necessarily, but every person who's gotten rich, like virtually 100% of wealthy people did not get rich from having multiple streams of income. They got rich from having one really amazing, effective stream of income. They did one thing really well that scaled and they went all in on that one thing and that's how they broke through the wall. And so that's our strategy for how we break anyone through the wall, whether it's financially, whether it's creating more margin in their life, whether it is with their messaging, which is a lot of what we do this day is, you know, helping people figure out what should their next book be about? How should they launch their speaking career? It's figuring out what is the one thing that you can do better or as good as anyone else in the world? And how do we go all in on on that thing? And a huge part of that is saying no to everything else. But it's it's less about going, what's the right thing to say no to? And it's more about just picking something and and saying yes to that and only that. And when you do that, that one thing is going to work. It's going to be successful without you getting any smarter or doing anything different. You're just you're just allocating more resources to that one thing. It's 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 not that hard to get your mind around, but for some reason, unconsciously, we never do it. It's brilliant. And it it doesn't mean that you've just from what just applying it in our life, the concept that we do, we have one concept, but we can apply it in multiple ways. So it's almost like take that one concept and decide which is the most best set of ways that is the way to deliver that idea of mental health, mind management, whatever it may be. And it, but you've got to think about it. That's the strategic part. You, I think there's so much. Not I think I know, and you've already intimated this, but there's these belief systems that that are in our zeitgeist of yes. balance in time and you know, to have a backup plan and multiple streams of income. It's so it's so in the in the psyche of our world and in our mindsets that that's kind of automatically the direction we go in. And as you say, it's not 
bad, but it's it kind of might keep you just sort of stuck at that level. If you want to do that explosion thing, if that's important to you, for some people it's not important, but if you feel you have a message, like we feel we have a message that is something that the world needs because we all need our minds right so that we can be decent humans, we have to, you have to find what's the best strategy and that means a lot of saying no. And honestly, for, for that's, a, that's a huge challenge. And, and, I, and I know people listening now may be thinking, is it so hard? Is it, it is hard. It isn't hard. It is hard to say no. But as you've so beautifully said, saying yes to these things that you don't really want to say yes to is no to the things that you do really count. So it does require, Rory, doesn't it, sitting down and almost like making a list of priorities. And I know you did that with Lewis. And, and I know we're doing a lot more strategy meetings with you where you sat down and made these lists. And We've, we've got strategy meetings all next week and we're going to sit and make a list. You know, what are our yeses and what are our noes? Can you talk about that concept? Cause you have all these, you like to make drawings and you have all these really cute ways of explaining things. I'd love you to explain a little bit of that. And I know I might have just interrupted you though, cause I don't know if you finished the focus tunnel because you've talked about eliminate. You didn't talk about, did you want to finish that first, that focus tunnel before the yes, no thing? Yeah. We could talk about what? the, that's related, right? We could talk about yeah. the focus funnel. You know, Whichever way you want to do it, but you, you, you're you the master of this. So. so here's what I would say is, I think this has, being successful has so much more to do with discipline than it does with intelligence. You know, the intelligent things feels like, oh, I should do a lot of things and I should manage it and I should like balance it all and like be able to orchestrate this this huge thing. Discipline is going, no, I'm going to keep it simple and I'm just going to go all in on one thing. And so the focus funnel to, to the focus funnel is, is a tool that we created that is designed to help you decide what is your next most significant thing. So in the context of how, how do we multiply time, which applies to all of us universally, but also if we say, if we choose like, how do we multiply your money as a business owner? We would do this. We would go through the same process. And, and then also in many ways, when we help someone figure out what their message, their life message should be, or like their personal brand should be, is, is very similar, is, is we're going through a, this process of funneling down to sort of figure out what is, the, what is the next most significant thing for you. And so if the goal to, to multiply time is to spend time on things today that create more time tomorrow, there's five big category, categories of things that will help you do that. And so we call this the focus funnel and we think about it as a giant funnel. So if you had all of your stuff to do coming in the top, right at the top of the funnel, of the focus funnel, and think of it as a visual, it's a visual in, in the Procrastinate on Purpose book, it's a visual, or if you, the TED Talk is free, you can just watch my TED Talk. Yeah. You know, you know it says eliminate. And that's because anything we say no to today creates time tomorrow because it's preventing us from doing something we otherwise would be doing, right? It prevents us from being obligated to something in the future by making a decision today. So that multiplies time in the future. If you can't eliminate something, then it drops down to the middle of the focus funnel, which is automate. And so now we go, okay, we know it must be done. The next question is, can I automate this? And one of the things that we've realized is that automation is to your time exactly what compounding interest is to your money. So just like compounding interest takes money and it turns it into more money, anytime you automate something or you create a process for it, it takes you time today, but then in the future, the process is handling it tomorrow. So it actually, it costs you time today, just like investing mm -hmm. costs you money today. It takes money out of your bank account today, but then compounding interest multiplies it. So automation does the same thing with your time. It costs me time now to build a process. And this is why most people don't build the processes. They go, I don't have time. I don't have time to make a process. I don't have time mm -hmm. to document it. I don't have time to create a checklist. Mm -hmm. Well, the, in reality, you don't have time not to because if you do that, you create the process. You know, I use online bill pay as the example, right? Yeah. If I said, you should take two hours today and set up online bill pay, people would go, what? How is that significant? That seems insignificant, but they're thinking of significance in the definition of if, if it's trivial or not. Yeah, yeah. When, when we use significant, we're not talking about trivial. We're talking about the impact over time, mm -hmm. how the impact on your time over time. So, if I spend 
two hours setting up online bill pay today. It costs me two hours that I probably don't have, but yeah. it saves me 30 minutes every month from paying my bills. So then in four months time, I will have broken even on that investment, 30, 30, 30, 30. That's 120 minutes or two hours. Every month thereafter for the rest of my life, I am multiplying time because that system, that process, that tool, that checklist, that software, that it, it, it is now doing the thing that I would have had to otherwise be doing. That's and so perfect. a huge part of what we do with personal brands is we automate their content marketing strategy, their, you know, their, their, their podcast strategy their We automate, you know, their onboarding, their recruiting, their, their, like their, how to deal with customer cancellations and requests. Like so much of it is just creating processes. So that's automate. Now, if you can't eliminate it, you can't automate it, then the next question is, can I delegate it? So I know the task must be done. Then it it can't be done by a process, but does it have to be done by me? And, you know, we have a whole big part on how to delegate, but the, the, the big aha here for people is to realize that 80% done right by someone else is always better than 100% done right by you. So good. A, a, a 80% mm-hmm. right done by someone else is better than 100% done right by you. Because over time, right, the reason we don't delegate is we go, they can't do it. No one could do it as well as me or as fast as me. And that is true once. It is true today. It is true absent the significance calculation. But when you make the significance calculation and you think about tomorrow and the next day and five years from now, you go, that person is going to be able to do it as well as you. They're probably going to be able to do it better than you because they have fewer total things to do. They're going to have more specialized focus. And so if you can, we call this the permission of imperfect. The permission of Mm -hmm. imperfection is a huge part of why many leaders get stuck. A lot of the the clients, the entrepreneurs that we work with, they get stuck in what we call the swamp. It's between two to $4 million in annual revenue. So like they get to that by working crazy and by being so good and and, and such gunslingers, but they can never get out of the swamp because because their business is completely dependent on them. Mm -hmm. They have to be there. They have to make the decisions. They have to solve all the problems. And the only way that you become an eight-figure entrepreneur really like is the business has to become less dependent on you. And in order for that to happen, you have to give yourself the short-term imperfection of allowing other people to do it 80% right, knowing that over time they'll figure it out and then it starts to scale. So it's it's sort of what you were saying earlier, Dr. Leaf. It's what got you here as a performer won't get you there as a leader. Mm-hmm. And there's this shift that has to happen. And so you got to where you are by demanding perfection and over-delivering and everything is right and organized and perfect and checklisted and like done. But if that's what you require of yourself and that is what you require, the good news is you get things to be perfect. The bad news is you have you have just you have just created a lifelong prison sentence for yourself to be the only person who can ever do it. And so you have to do it. And so you can never multiply. You can never expand. You're trapped. And so anyways, that's delegate. Sorry, I know I'm going no, fast. No, it's brilliant. And and if I may just comment on that very quickly before you yes, do the last one. Please. So that, that prison sentence is burnout because that level of getting to that drive, et cetera, is, and then, you know, that can, that goes in so many different directions. Applying that principle that you have, and I'm just going to give it very broadly because it's not the detail, but I have a, a couple of people on, on my research team. That's a big part of what I do. And I've been either giving them, we doing this research and giving them training. And I gave them a task. And this, as you were talking, I didn't actually, I should have been smiling because your words, it happened. It happened because I gave them after it's been about six, eight months now, they're working with them. Okay. And they, I'd given them a task and I had actually delegated something that I would have done. This is something that I definitely would have done a hundred percent. And I thought, okay, let them do it. And I had this sort of, this in the back of my mind, let's see what happens. Well, they came back with 150%. I didn't even expect I don't know what I expected, but it was it was a, it was a risk, and it and that hundred and fifty that they came back with 
told, I couldn't even express it to my team afterwards yet. So I actually had to get a couple of my team on to here. So look at this, because this is what we were trying to crack after a meeting with you. And I threw something out at this person. I didn't expect this back. And I got something back that they didn't even know what they'd done, but it had triggered another level of development in my mind. And I saw something that would have taken up to potentially six months of my time to create. I saw with the right team, I could do this in a month. And that's, that saved me time. That decision was multiplied my time. And yes. It's like I, I said, I said some no's, I said some yeses, and I did an 80% do let someone else do it. And I, does that make sense? What I've said, and I got yes, 150 that's a hundred back. That's a perfect even, example. <laughs> so that's I'm like a laughing perfect. to myself. I did it without, you see, you're such a good teacher. No, well, well, so actually, so you, this is a great point because you're a multiplier, Dr. Leaf. There's no doubt about it. What in, in our second, the, in Procrastinate Purpose book, we refer to them as multipliers. In Take the Stairs, we refer to them as ultra performers. You are both of them. You're doing instinctively, though, what most people don't realize. Most people don't. So you do it ex- instinctively. And so all we did was basically put the vernacular around it with the focus funnel to go, here's what's going on in the subconscious mind of a multiplier. They can't explain, really, they can't articulate how they do what they do. They just, they know that they do it, but not everybody does. And so that's, if you go, if you want to understand the psychology of those ultra performers, that's like mm-hmm. a big a big part of, of what we were studying there. So, so to come back to the focus funnel, so if you can't eliminate it, you can't automate it. Sometimes you can't delegate it, right? There's certain things you can't, you can't delegate. There's certain things you have to do. There's relationships, your own health. You know, there's there's certain things that that have to be done by you. But then there's another question, which is, must it be, be done now, or can it wait until later? And if it can wait until later, that's where we call we call it procrastinate on purpose, which is where the title of the book comes from. Mm-hmm. That's just one of the four things: is to basically procrastinate on the trivial things. You know, you don't have to have the perfectly clean desk in order to do the things that are really grow your business, right? So it's like, okay, I can, I can put the, I don't have to have, maybe having a zero inbox isn't the most important thing in this season right now. Spending time with my kids is or whatever, right? It's that kind of a thing. So you procrastinate on purpose with the trivial things as a way of creating excess margin that you then redeploy or you reinvest into the things that you must do. And so if you can't eliminate, automate, delegate it, or procrastinate on it on purpose, then it slides into what we call concentrate. And concentrate are the things that must be done. They must be done by you. They must be done right now. And they are the things that multiply your time. They're the things that you must spend time on today that create more time tomorrow. And if you do that over and over and over, the, the, the impact and the influence and the income that you create in your life becomes exponential, right? And this is where, you know, I was raised by a single mom. I was born in a trailer. We moved nine times in the first 11 years. We wow. had, we, you know, we, we were on Wix, you know, we, we mm-hmm. spent, you know, not a lot of nights, but we spent a few nights in, in, you know, the women's shelters and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and you go, my life, I've gone from that to wherever I am now, which is, you know, for, for, from that place is radically different. And it's just because of the compounding effect of these decisions, these choices, this type of thinking over time. And, and it's available to anybody and then, you know, and now what most of what we're doing these days is we're helping people who are people who want to multiply their message, people who want to multiply their impact in the world, people who want to make a difference in the lives of others. We're applying not only the business principles, the financial principles and the time principles, but branding and marketing to help them get their message out to more people, which is, of course, you know, what created the lovely intersection of, of me and you. Oh. And you did so well. You did so well. You you asked us a question. One of the first questions that I heard you ask, talk to Lewis about, and it came up in our in our in our discussion. And it, it's it's like one of my favorite questions. I think I ask it the most. And I'm going to just find. Uh, here we go. What problem do you solve? To what question are you the answer? And the first time I heard you say that, and it was actually Lewis's conference. And then I heard you mm-hmm. say it in his interview, and I think a couple of times, wherever. But it grabbed me. It, it, I've heard it, but it really grabbed me when I heard you say it at, in our in our meeting, and it, it made me think and think and think. And th- that is a great place to start because 
with that attitude, it's not about us. There's a, a quantum physicist that I follow that's a theorist. And the my work in brain science and all that stuff, I'm very interested in quantum physics and all these kinds of things. But it's not about, he makes a comment. It's not about you. It's about you in the world. And we've been playing around with the concept of purpose. And I know that's very much part of what you talk about. And when in terms of of in terms of brain science, in terms of psychoneurobiology, purpose plays a role in that whatever you do, it's not so much about you finding that thing that you do. It's about you doing that thing that's actually going to change others. And I think that's what was the connection. I, I saw you saying that. And that's what yeah. grabbed my attention. And that question has been one that it, it's every day it's going through my head. What is the problem that you solve? And to what question are you the answer? And, it, and it, it, it's got such great application because this doesn't just apply to a business person or someone trying to grow a business. This is a human question. This mm-hmm. is the question because there's something that I've said for years in my work, and I don't know if you've ever heard me say it, but there's something you can do that no one else can do. I said that mm-hmm. thousands of times Beautiful. for 38 years, and it's the same kind of concept. So it's that we don't have to compete with each other because that just pulls us down. We have to enhance each other. And so that question, okay, I'm going on and on, but that question is beautiful and it's so mentally healthy. Can you just talk around that question? What does that mean to you and whatever you want to say about that? Because it's a great, great two comments, two questions, I should say. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Leaf. So I, I think from a business strategy, okay, let's table the mental health and the emotional side, but just from a strate- a business tactical strategy, you know, it is one of the first questions we ask is what problem do you solve in one word? You got to answer that in one word. And the reason is because what people will spend money on is solving problems. And what most businesses Mm -hmm. do is they try to market the solution. What most messengers do is they try to market their message. They try to tell the world their truth. But what people really will pay for is to solve a problem. And so from a marketing perspective, the, the better you, a better job you do at communicating this issue Right. And so, for example, the problem, the problem that we solve for people's obscurity is if they're unclear, untrusted and unknown about how they want to present in the world and, and how to how to how to monetize who they are. Right. They're they're not yet well known and they're and they're also unclear on exactly what their uniqueness is. That's the problem that we solve in the world. So when people go, yes, I have that problem, they can quickly go. We should we should talk to Brand Builders Group. Right. Make Maybe we should talk to them. By the way, we do the first call with everybody for free. We were a one-on-one coaching firm, training company. We do the first call with everybody for free. And if you want, Amazing. you can go to go to freebrandcall.com slash Dr. Leaf. Freebrandcall.com we'll slash Dr. Leaf. We'll, we'll put that, yeah. that link in the show notes. Awesome. So so you go, the 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 more clear you are, if, if you're not clear about what problem you solve, then no one else is either. Right. Like if you're not clear about the problem you solve, then there's no way your customers are, which means it's very hard to hire them. And 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 here's a mistake on a business tactical side. Too many businesses, I think, focus on trying to be the best. Right. And you Mm -hmm. go, do you really need to be the best? I mean, it's like, okay, you know, my basement's flooding. Do I really need the best plumber in the world? You know, like, do I really need the world's greatest dentist? Do I really need the best house cleaner? Do I really need the best mechanic in the world? Right? Like, for the most part, we don't, most of what we do, we don't need the world's best. Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on being the best, we should focus on being the clearest, right? It's like, I have a flood. I need a plumber. Who's available? You're a plumber? Great. Come on over. Like, the the, the threshold is much lower than we think. (laughs) And but if you can't if you can't clearly market the problem, you're going to struggle to get people to buy from you because the people pay for you know. We think that people spend money on luxuries. Like when we think of money, we think of oh, cars and vacations and homes. Mm-hmm. But in reality, what people spend money on is if you got a flat tire, you find the money to fix it. If the water mm-hmm. heater breaks, you find the money. If your kid gets sick, needs to go to the hospital, you find the money. People find the money to solve problems. So you, as a as a as a business owner, as a messenger, as a, I'm I'm talking to you listening, not you, Doctor Leaf, but you <laughs> listening. Yeah. If, if if you can be the solution to someone's problem, now all of a sudden they're going to buy from you. But much more important than that, 
much more meaningful than that, much more powerful than that is the impact that this has on your personal life, whether you're in business or not. And people sometimes say, well, they struggle to answer that question. What problem do I solve? And now, you know, that we've taken 1,700 people through this process. So our, our initial process is a, it's a two-day experience called Finding Your Brand DNA. We take people through this two-day process. It's very introspective. We ask all these questions to help them find their uniqueness so they can exploit it in the service of others, which is a quote that I heard from a gentleman named Larry Wingett. Find Beautiful. your uniqueness, exploit it in the service of others. Well, as we started coaching our team on how to take people through this, it was like, man, People struggle to figure out what problem do I solve? What problem do I solve? And then we found the shortcut. We found the world's greatest shortcut. And I can, I can tell you how to do this quickly, okay? So if you're listening, Wonderful. we realize this pattern. And here's the pattern. It is realizing you are most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. You are most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. So for most of us, the answer to that question is going to lie somewhere inside of what what challenge have you conquered? What obstacle have you overcome? What setback have you survived? What tragedy have you triumphed over? You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be on national television. You don't have to be a New York Times bestselling author. You don't have to speak on stages in front of thousands of people in order for your life to have purpose. In order for your life to have purpose, you need to be useful. Too many people are chasing happiness. They're going, how can I be happier? What we have found is that is what you is what you said is instead of trying to find something that will make you happy, find someone you can help. And if you start to be useful, happiness will show up. If you are in service, happiness will show up. It's, it, we are happiest, like our highest, our highest self is to be our highest value to others. Mm -hmm. And when we are our highest value to others, we become our highest self and we feel that, right? It's not just a business strategy. We go, I am playing a role in the world. I am, I am solving a problem in the world. I am an ambassador. I am taking a stand, right? So yes, with Lewis Howes, we helped him get really clear that the problem he solves is self-doubt. And, you know, according to him, that's been pretty transformational for his clarity and his business has grown a lot. There's other people in the world, you know, Brene Brown, she solved the, the problem of shame. Like she dedicated her life to studying shame and you can't talk about shame without talking about Brene Brown. Dave Ramsey built a huge personal brand. This is a, a multi-hundred million dollar business. Dave Ramsey owns the problem of debt. He teaches people how to become debt free. And for 30 years, he's dedicated his life to that. Those are great businesses. Those people have built great businesses. But Mother Teresa, she dedicated her life to ridding the world of poverty. And she changed the world and she became famous. That wasn't her goal. She didn't care at all about that. But she dedicated her life to eradicating poverty. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dedicated his life to ridding the world of inequality, to, to solving the problem of racism. And separate of fame and separate, so separate of influence and separate of income, what they got was purpose. What they got was value. Their mm -hmm. lives, our lives have meaning in the con inside of the context of how we serve and help other people. And so when we're finding someone's uniqueness, it's much less about the monetization strategy and it's more about going, what is the, what is the path that you have walked down? What is, what are you uniquely equipped? Who? It's, it's really about starting with who. Who are you uniquely equipped to serve? It's getting outside of ourselves. You know, I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. I, I adore Simon Sinek. I love him. He's one of my favorite authors. And I really love Start With Why. But what I've realized is that for many of us, our why, and, you know, with companies, you sort of start with why. But with individual people and personal brands like we work with, for most of us, our why is a who. It's a person. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, 
it's our kids. We want to make our kids proud, or we want to we want to we want to buy a home for our parents, or we want to provide a, a life for our our spouse or for our employees, or we want to get people to break free from poverty or racism. For most of us, our why is a who, and and the who is not ourselves. The who is someone else, and so your uniqueness lies right there at the intersection of being becoming clear on the idea that for most of us, like, no, for all of us, we're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. So start with who, and and that the problem that you solve will become clear. You'll find your place in the world. You'll find passion. You'll find profit. And most of all, you'll find peace. And I, I, I think peace is really the new prophet. Oh, wow. Mic drop. Peace is the new prophet. Peace. I did a, a talk this morning, or yesterday, sorry, and this morning on peace being the fuel that, you know, the battery like a car's charge, it, it, it fuels you. But seriously, what you just said, there was another TED talk. It was a mic drop. It was a boom moment. It was the truth. And that, thank you for sharing that so passionately and so beautifully. That was really great. And that's very, very, very helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm learning as I'm listening to you all the time. And you, you say things that we know are truth. Did you just say it very beautifully? And, and it's so strategically said, so defined, so clear. So thank you, Rui. That's really amazing. Now we've got about two minutes left. Okay. And to make you make you do, or if you can give me five more minutes, it'll be amazing. But uh, I, I'm good. Is... I, I got time. The kids are asleep, so they're, <laughs> they're okay. Wake up, so okay. I'm, I'm okay. good until okay. they wake up. If you hear okay. banging on the door, then <laughs> then we know that it's time to <laughs> the end of the last interview. I did the dog started. There's someone's dog started barking. So we, it was time right on cue. As, as the, yeah, time was up. It was really cute. If we could wrap up, and I know you can't do this really in more than five minutes, so just an overview of the dare principle that you that you have so brilliantly oh. mastered. I'd love to, because I, I just like the fact that you know it's almost like you're daring us to be ourselves. You've set the you set the stage, so it's, it's a nice. And people can go and get your books and can get hold of you and learn how to do this. But is it okay? Can you maybe spend about five or six or seven minutes explaining that principle about the dares you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. There's. Yes, absolutely. And 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 like I said, by the way, if 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 any of you want to talk to us more, like just go to freebrandcall.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. We'll, you know, talk to you. You can talk to our team. We'll help, you know, try to get you clear on what what your uniqueness might be. And we'll show you like the whole game plan for how we help build and monetize personal brands and just, you know, help entrepreneurs grow. But so dares is another idea that ties into uniqueness. Okay, so when we try to find someone's uniqueness, we're trying to, there's a number of different indicators of what we look at. There's these hints, these clues, right? Like the person they once were. Also their education level. You know, what do they have results in? We, we, look, at, we look at also the things that they're most passionate about. Like what breaks your heart? What makes you sad? What makes you cry? You know, what is an issue that you look out in the world and you go, I'm not okay with that issue existing in the world. I'm going to, I would be willing to dedicate my life to solving that problem. We believe, we believe that is God's divine design of your humanity, that what breaks your heart, breaks your heart for a reason. And that's because you were specifically put on this earth. You were created to do something about that problem. And that all of your pain and your heartbreak and your past challenges we're really about preparing you and shaping you into becoming the person that you needed to be one day for someone else. So that's most of where we live. But we marry it with monetization strategy, which I know might kind of seem like well, that's out of left field, but it's really not because we also believe that wherever you're getting natural momentum financially is an indicator of part of this, you know, God's divine design for your life. It's like you, when when you're living inside of who you were created to be, not everything should be a fight. Not everything should be just like awful. Like it should come easier. You should have this sort of state of flow. And money is is not the ultimate scoreboard for us. It's not, but it's it's it is an it's an important scoreboard and it's a clear scoreboard that can really kind of say like, are we growing or not? Not just because you want to have your own wealth, but because you can give and do so many things. But so when we look at monetization strategy. There's a number of different ways that you can monetize a personal brand. There's five five different ways. We call them the paids. But when we go, 
we, we kind of ask, what's the one you most want to do is we look at something called the dares and in the perfect business model would have these characteristics in common. So it, it's dares is an acronym and the D stands for digital. The A stands for automated. The R stands for recurring. The E stands for evergreen and the S stands for scalable. Digital, automated, recurring, evergreen, and scalable. And so what we're looking for is to go, if you were going to design the perfect business, we'd want it to have as many of those characteristics because if it's digital, that means we have no manufacturing costs. We have no warehouses. We have no plants, production lines. We have no shipping costs. We have no tariffs, none of that stuff. It's digital. Automated means it's completely self-service by the customer. A fully a, a vending machine is a fully automated business model. It's not digital, but it is automated, right? Nobody has to be there is required to like service the customer. Recurring means that people will pay for it again and again and again. So, you know, that's recurring revenue and those companies have higher valuations and there's a lot of great cash flow benefits to a business to, to, to build recurring revenue. It's one of our specialties is helping people understand how to create recurring revenue in their business and how to how to like maximize retention, et cetera. Evergreen, evergreen means it never needs to be updated. So, you know, you build the widget once and then you never have to change it, right? I mean, if you, you know, if you create a pair of scissors, like you don't have to update it. You can just sell a bazillion scissors and it's 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 an evergreen thing. Probably not recurring though, because, you know, I don't need that many pair of scissors. Like my scissors don't run out that often, right? So there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these. And then the S is scalable. And what scalable means is, scalable means that you can grow. Well, well, here, let me explain. Here's the difference between scale and growth. <laughs> so to gr growth means you grow revenue. And you can grow the revenue of a company very quickly and simply, which is by growing expenses, right? You spend more money on advertising, you hire more people, like you, you, you pay for more leads, you will grow the revenue, but expenses grow with it. So that's, the, that's not scale, that's growth. What mm -hmm. scale is, is being able to create revenue growth without creating expense growth. So it's going, I can add lots of customers without having to increase my infrastructure. And so the dares just serve as a framework. They're one of our many frameworks, as, you, as you've alluded to. We've got lots of diagrams and charts and frameworks that we inside of our curriculum at Brand Builders Group. But it serves just as basically a backdrop for a conversation to, to go, okay, what would your perfect business model be? What does your business lend itself to? What skills does your team have? What technology do you have access to that you're good with or that we could, you know, create to just create dares to, to create a, a, you know, a life that you love, a business that you love so that you can spend more time just like operating inside of your divine uniqueness? Oh, brilliant. Love it. Well, it's working for us. We love it. I highly recommend people reach out to Rory. We'll have all your links and details in the show notes. I can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom. You've been so generous with your wisdom and your time and your ideas and how you've blended in the humanity with the business. And it's just been fantastic. And you, you're a tremendous asset for, to the world to, to help people to get their message out there and, and to unashamedly uh -huh. also make money, which is there's nothing wrong with that because the more money you have, the more people you can help as well. So you, you say that with, with, with honesty and, and great. It's great. It's, this has been fantastic. I've enjoyed this so much. I love, always love talking to you. And I know that I have the opportunity of talking to you again very soon. And I recommend that people really reach out and speak to you because it's, it's, it's a great thing that you're doing. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's been amazing. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. You've made such a massive impact in the world. It's such an honor to be thank a you. part of this. And, you know, the last little thing I would just leave everybody with is, is if you, if you feel a calling on your heart, to share a message with the world. If you feel a calling on your heart to, to like get your message out there, going to quantum physics, we believe that the calling you feel on your heart is the result of a signal that's being sent out from Absolutely. someone who, who needs you. And that person needs you more than you need them. And the only reason we don't respond to that calling is when we're self-centered. And we go, oh, I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I could figure out. I don't know if anyone would like me. I don't know if I'm different enough from other people who, who are out there. 
you know, I'm afraid that people might not, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified, et cetera. And you only feel fear when you're thinking about yourself. Fear is a totally self-centered concept. There is no fear once the mission to serve becomes clear. Once you realize that you're dedicating your life to helping and saving other people, you go, yeah, I'd run through a fire to save those people. I would do things that I never thought possible that I would normally never do myself. But if it if it's a matter of helping someone else, you will run through walls. And, and that is how it is. There is somebody out there right now who is begging and pleading and quite possibly, quite literally on their hands and knees, praying for answers to questions that you know, like the back of your hand, not because you're a, a PhD or the world's leading renowned person, although if you're Dr. Leaf, you are, but um, even if if you're not, it's just because you've been there and you've mm-hmm. been through that pain and you've walked down that broken road. And that's that's the credibility that you you need to reach back and, and help those people. You're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. So thank you, Dr. Lee, for having oh, me. That was, you're the best. You're the best. That was beautiful. Thank you, my friend. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. What a great way to end the show. Thank you.